Over to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for coming. There's a lot more people than I thought there would be. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I'll just start, um, I think, by getting people to sort of have in mind um, what you were saying about questions of value and what is valuable. And the book that I've sort of brought to illustrate that to begin with is um, my first edition of Vera Britton's Thrice a Stranger, which is here, which is in many ways completely ruined. Um, by Manchester Public Library. Um, so I've got a shelf mark stamped directly onto the dust jacket spine. Um, I've got, in fact, a stamp there. I also have a stamp here, but when you get to that point, you realise that it's also signed by Vera Britton. So this is kind of a bit of a paradoxical book in terms of value, because the signature is obviously massively exciting, especially if you're me and you quite like Vera Britton. Um, and the, uh, the stamps around the dust jacket and in fact on the boards themselves um, kind of yeah destroy that value additionally the dust jacket has been sewn on with this plastic thing um, I have no idea why I've never seen a book be like that before especially not a book that was apparently being looked after by a library but what's exciting about that is that um, this is the yellow and magenta Victor Golang's dust jackets, which are really quite hard to find in good condition because the paper was notoriously terrible quality. So I don't have any others um, like this that where the dust jacket is intact. So the only reason that I could A, afford a first edition of this book and a signed one is because it's one where the value has been diminished in many other ways. Um, and the only reason that I can have one with a dust jacket is because the library have come along and sewn plastic onto it. Um, I also think it's an interesting way in which the text and the material object are kind of working together because Vera Britton, in all of her writings and, and activism, was very much involved in socialism, pacifism, as many of you will know. Um, and I think there's something quite interesting about her signing a public library copy um, She's, as you'll see if you read one of her notebooks, which we have here from the Bodleian, she's also quite um, into her own self-image and she's quite self-important in a lot of her writings. But I think um, she would have liked the demonstration of augmenting the value of a copy that would be available to ordinary people. Um, and yeah, I think there's a lot of personality involved in that book. So you can come and have a look at this one later because it's already been destroyed, so that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what I'm mainly going to show today is the section of my collection that really focuses on letters because that was something that really came out of writing the essay. I realised that I actually have a sort of subsection about letters and I was trying to think about um, why I find them interesting and what's important about letters. So I'm going to start over here. These are... Um, that is the selected letters of Vera Britton and Winfrey Holtby. There are only 500 copies of the first edition signed by Vera Britton. Um, that is number 252. Um, this is Winifred Holtby's letters to a friend. The friend is for once not Vera Britton, um, a friend called Jean McWilliam, who was a head teacher of a girls' school in South Africa. Um, and it's fascinating that Winifred Holtby is a very different person when she's not writing to Vera Britton. And, um, I think the friendship between them is often portrayed as one in which Vera was kind of overbearing and needy at the same time and Winifred doesn't really have a personality except to serve Vera and um, you read Winifred's letters outside of Vera and even though these are still of course edited by Vera you, you realise that um, she's a very different person. And then here we have Rose Macaulay's letters to her sister um, which are here because we have some letters in the Bodleian by Rose Macaulay and so there you have the printed versions. Um, so yeah, my, my favourite line in the whole of um, Britain and Holtby's correspondence that I've read, which is bookmarked there for people to have a look at, is from April 16th, 1924. So Winifred has just been to visit Cicely Hamilton um, and is complaining that Cicely Hamilton is very patronising. And then she tails off saying to Vera, Vera darling, when you become eminent, treat the little worms nicely. They do like it. Um, <laughs> I, I, I like that line. Um, I feel like saying it to my friends in Oxford quite a lot, actually, because everyone here seems always on the verge of becoming eminent. Um, and you can kind of hear that Winifred and Vera have that sort of friendship. Um, but Winifred, yeah, she's often presented as, as the, the sort of lesser of the two. But I think, actually, when you read the letters, you realise that she knows that and she's playing off it and she's teasing Vera. 
Um, I think she knows that Vera wants to be seen as the genius of the two of them. Um, and I think you can hear the laughing smile as she writes it down and you realise that although these letters are always an exchange between them, they are also about individuality and they are also about Winifred Holtby's own voice. Um, even though all of these are published after her death, um, she's still very much there kind of pushing back at Vera's dominance, um, which is quite fun. Um, so yeah, I, I came, like most people, I came to Winifred Holtby via Vera Britton, via Testament of Youth, but um, South Riding is possibly my favourite novel ever. I've never said that before, but it might be true. Um, and so that's why I bought South Riding with the money from um, the Colin Franklin Prize, which is incredible. Um, unfortunately, in some ways, it's the best copy I've ever seen. Um, I probably should have, in keeping with my values, bought one that was a bit scruffier, but um, that one is genuinely wonderful. And the reason that I like it is because the dust jacket is perfect, which enables you to see on the inside flap, um, Collins have done a little um, blurb where they say, South Riding is unquestionably the greatest novel we have been privileged to publish, which is a bold statement from a publisher like Collins, and not something that I've ever seen on a book quite so clear cut, and also not something that anyone is ever going to say about Winifred Holtby after about 1937. After she dies, there's um, a space of publications all about her, um, and there's this intense interest in her, which then tails off, and, and now she's kind of consigned to Middle Brow. Um, and you have to look at the first edition, and you have to look at a good first edition and the care that was taken over it, to realise that actually, at the height of her fame, she was not seen in that way at all. She was seen as um, really in the upper echelons of literary society. And that also brings us back to the letters because it's in the letters that we see this kind of chaotic mess of literary life for women, particularly in London, um, in the 20s and 30s, that um, at one point Winifred says, life is a chaos, and then she lists, we have in the house A, electricians, B, painters, C, upholsterers, D, Charles spring cleaning, and she says that this is this is her apology for a scratchy response to Vera's updates from London um, on the publications um, and sales of her latest book. Um, so the presence of people in their house being paid to do the spring cleaning for them obviously puts these people in the comfortably well-off middle classes. They are not in quite so much of a chaos as Winifred might like to make out. But nonetheless, there's a sense, I think, beginning here of that sort of double bind in which um, society has put women, now that these women are all working all the time, but their domestic responsibilities haven't decreased and women are expected to be everything now. Um, and I think the letters are really important if you want to think about um, the lives of 20th century women writers because it's here that you realise that the two lives of public literary profile and private domestic chaos are not two lives at all but they are the same life, it's all one chaos. Um, Rose McCauley does this really beautifully. Um, these are all letters to her sister, so they're very intimate, they're very close, but they have a lot of playfully intellectual and at the same time completely silly, mis mischievous discussions. Um, so earlier on than the page I've bookmarked, there's, there's a bit where they're talking about the difference between love and desire. Um, and Rose McCauley jokes, similarly, as Socrates used to put it, the important part of an electric lamp is the light it gives, but the light is a function of the physical structure. Um, and this is, this is in the middle of a very long paragraph where she's talking about whether or not men fall in love with you or desire you first and what the difference is between the two. Um, and then she gets bored of having this serious, kind of profound, emotionally engaged discussion and just starts talking about Socrates and electric lamps. Um, <laughs> and, and her sister kind of comes back to her and is, Rose, don't be scared. Um, and uh, so these are the kinds of discussions which you can only have with people that you know really well and yet in the later 20th century, this is published in the late 60s, um, there's a very intense market for reading these kinds of intimate discussions that were had by women writers. There's a sense that we cannot understand the books that they wrote without having that sense of background and an emotional background. There's a really intense need to understand the emotional lives of women um, and I think as important as that is, it's also important to realise that most of the time they're making fun of their own emotions. These letters are screamingly funny. Um, and even the big events of the 20th century are laughed at. So the page that I have bookmarked for Rose Macaulay is um, 
the day that she, this is the 10th of November 1928, I think, she has to go and be a literary witness for the Well of Loneliness trial, um, which she takes seriously on the one hand, but again, she finds it funny, um, because history isn't history if you're living in it and it's part of your day-to-day -day life and you have to go and have coffee with D.H. Lawrence afterwards. Um, and I think it's important to read these letters to understand the tone, to understand the attitude um, that these women had towards the fact that um, they were in the midst of all of these very illustrious people now. I mean, these are a really seriously elite group of writers. It's a very small group of people. The same names will come up time and time again. Um, we can reconstruct an entire world out of these letters, but it's a tiny world that could and indeed did squeeze itself into the same drawing room if it needed to. Um, so yeah, that's um, pretty much everything that I have to say specifically, other than um, these ones, these first editions of novels here, are all things that are mentioned in some letters that the Bodleian has. Um, and so I've brought those along because it's just serendipitous and fun that I happen to have um, The Little Girls and The Echoing Grove. Um, and you can see Elizabeth Bowen and Rosamund Lehman writing um, about the writing of those novels. Um, I don't have the book that we have Rose Macaulay mentioning, partly because we don't know what it is. She says in one of these letters that she's writing a book about Portugal. There are two Rose Macaulay titles with the word Portugal in them. We don't know which one she's talking about because she doesn't date her letters, so date your letters, people. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I brought The World My Wilderness instead, which is a good place to end, I guess, because um, it's a completely beautiful cover. It's also... Um, a wonderful summing up, I think, of what I love about the mid 20th century and women writers in that the story of The Well My Wilderness is um, a little girl who has been living in the south of France among resistance fighters for the whole of the Second World War, being brought home to London, to a bombed out London after the war, to live with her very austere father. Um, and she goes completely wild running around St Paul's and St Paul's Yard and um, watching wildflowers grow from the rubble. And um, this was an enormously popular book, um, made Rose Macaulay quite rich. Um, and I think it's that sense of fun. It's that sense of laughing in the face of quite horrendous things, quite troubling things, um, difficult things that is so wonderful about the 20th century. It's the fact that all of these women in their letters and their novels give you permission to laugh, even though this is a cataclysmic century where one thing after another seems to go wrong, they want you to find it funny.